Welcome to Question Time. On tonight's panel, Anne-Marie Trevelyan, the government's Minister for Business and Energy, previously International Aid Secretary until the post was abolished by Boris Johnson last year. Labour's Shadow Secretary for Health and Social Care, John Ashworth. Daisy Cooper, elected in 2019 and since last September, Education Spokesperson and Deputy Leader of the Liberal Democrats. Joining us down the line, historian, regular contributor to Radio 4's Thought for the Day and Daily Telegraph columnist, Tim Stanley and Chief Executive of Oxfam GB and former Director General of the Royal Commonwealth Society, Danny Sriskandaraja. Good evening. Welcome to my guest here in the studio. Tim, very good to see you joining us down the line. Thank you very much. And of course, welcome to you, my Zoom audience. My cutie 50 joining us. Very good to see you all waving. Very nice indeed. And of course, welcome to you at home watching. Do join in the conversation in the usual way on social media at BBC Question Time and we'll hear what you've got to say as well. So our first question tonight is from Alex Williams. Is the cloud of questions currently surrounding Boris Johnson's improper behaviour tittle-tattle or a real scandal? Well, you've asked the question, Alex. What do you think? I think it's a real scandal. I think it's probably the tip of a very large iceberg. I think he could clear the issue up very quickly if he chose to be transparent and honest. And the fact that he's not being suggests he's concealing something more. And I think that's a real shame because it attacks the democratic process. Voters can only vote confidently if they feel certain that they're getting honest and reliable information. John Ashworth. I totally agree with Alex. It is a scandal. And the reason why these questions are continuing to circulate is because Boris Johnson has failed to provide a full and frank explanation as to who paid for the lavish upgrade of his Downing Street flat. Well, of course, he says that he has paid for it. The question is who paid for it initially, I think. Indeed, indeed. And this matters. And it matters, I believe, for two reasons. First of all, it matters in its own right because we as politicians should be held to higher standards and we should stand for principles of honesty and integrity. And it's not good enough to say, oh, this is just typical Boris Johnson. We know he lies. We know he plays fast and loose. It's just the way he is. That isn't good enough because if we think that is good enough, we're really descending as a society. But the second reason why it matters is because somebody did pay initially for this. Somebody either put a, uh, a donation through Tory party head office or loaned the money to Boris Johnson. And when Boris Johnson is the most powerful politician in the land, we need to know who is potentially buying influence. We need to know who he is beholden to. We need to know when he received this loan, when he paid it back, why he didn't declare it. And it's not good enough just to say, well, he's paid for it and the taxpayer didn't pay for it. If this donor is winning contracts from the government, if this donor is winning taxpayer contracts, like we've seen with donors over PPE, then ultimately we are all paying for it because they're getting something back. It cannot be one rule for Boris Johnson and something for the rest of us. We do need everything out in the open now because otherwise this scandal won't go away. Anne-Marie? So I'm afraid I disagree with that. I think uh, it is uh, an opportunity to uh, make mischief. The Prime Minister was very clear yesterday at Prime Minister's Questions that he has uh, paid for uh, those costs for the upgrade of uh, his flat. But he uh, didn't answer the question that was put to him as who paid it, who paid for it initially. So what's the answer to that question? So he has said that he's paid the bill and I think what's important... No, but the, the question was who well, paid I, for it I, initially? I can't offer you an answer because... But, he didn't say either, but well, you don't know either? Well, I haven't had a personal discussion with him on this. I haven't seen him. Uh, but he's been very clear that he's paid for it. And I think what's important here, uh, and actually somebody raised it today, they said there seem to be all so many different ways that ministers are held to account. Uh, and there are in a number of ways, and quite rightly so, those systems exist uh, to make sure that, as John says, that we uh, live to the standard that uh, our voters expect. And the Electoral Commission has decided to uh, look at the Conservative Party's uh, finances, and that's absolutely fine, and that's how it should be. And the Prime Minister has been very clear that he will indeed, you know, if there's a requirement for him to, to provide any documentation that's required. But he's also been very why, clear that why he has... Why do you think he's not actually... Why has he not answered the question 
of who initially paid for it? Because well, he must know. I think he's answered the question that he's paid for it. No, uh, but he hasn't asked the question who initially paid for it. Why is he not answering that well, question? Well, I can't tell you because I'm not the Prime Minister, but I th you know, I'm very comfortable with the fact that he said it has been paid for uh, out of his pocket, and that's that's fine. And should there be uh, alternatives that the electric commission need to investigate, he said he's very happy uh, to provide any documentation that's required. And indeed, uh, he has also been very clear that officials have uh, made sure all the way through that everything was fine, and I'm very comfortable uh, with the Prime Minister's answer. There's lots of hands up, so let's hear from some of our audience. Uh, Hannah. It's the, we're saying that he said he's paid for it, but again, like you said, he hasn't said who initially paid for it. Did he always intend to pay for it? And I think that's the thing. Was this, he saw as a way of, of cash for access, as we've seen with Cameron um, and lobbying. We've had that very recently. There's no, um, there hasn't been a clear answer. You can say that there has because he said he has covered the cost, but when he covered that cost and did he actually anticipate covering that cost when the money was originally spent? I don't think that's been answered at all. Sherry? Uh, yeah, I, I'm interested to know why, uh, well, firstly, um, who made the accusation and why was it taken so seriously? And secondly, even if he didn't pay for it straight away, we all buy stuff on buy now, pay later. Why shouldn't he? Will? Yeah, I think for me, this is just kind of the tip of the iceberg at the moment. Uh, you know, the, the, since Boris has been in power, it just seems to have been scandal after scandal. And legality aside, whether it's legal or not, it's just the moral issue. I think he just completely treats the public with disdain. Uh, and I think it, he's got to stop. Danny. Look, I think it's not for me to say whether um, you know, uh, to pass judgment on, on this matter, but I do know from our experience at Oxfam about how important transparency is. You know, the only way that we've made progress in, in recent years across the world has been to bring in much higher standards of openness and transparency. And, you know, for many people in this country, the hope is that we'll come out of this pandemic, this, you know, huge shock to our nation, building back fairer, because we'll create a fairer, better society, but an equally important part is to build back institutions that people can once again trust. And so I think it's really important, not just on this issue, but a number of other issues we've seen recently, that we see politicians go over and above when it comes to transparency. Tim, you've been listening and shaking your head a bit, I noticed. <laughs> um, on the one hand, it's number 10's fault because it won't answer that question of who initially paid for it. And when it doesn't do that, that opens the possibility for speculation. But and why do you think they're not answering that question? Wild. Why do you think There's they're not answering that question at number 10? Sorry? Why do you think they're not answering that question at number 10? Well, presumably because the answer is embarrassing. That's the only reason why you wouldn't give an answer. But I don't understand why they don't give it anyway, because I don't assume there is a scandal here. I mean, a lot of the people who have spoken already have assumed, they have speculated that there is something beneath the iceberg. I'm not quite so sure there is. I think it's worth bearing in mind uh, that lots of politicians uh, have charged the taxpayer to redecorate residences. In this instance, that wasn't what was happening. Uh, the Prime Minister has paid for it himself. It's also worth bearing in mind that the original blind trust idea, which he's reported to have come up with, uh, is how parts of the US presidency is financed at the White House. So it's, it's not internationally unusual at all. But the thing with Boris Johnson is that people voted for him knowing that he doesn't do things the normal way, that he's an unusual character. But they, they wanted that. They wanted someone who cut through what they regarded as a, as, as a stagnant, frozen political system to get things done. And what Boris Johnson is going to be saying in the run up to the all important Hartley Paul by election is, I got us out of the EU. And I rolled out uh, a world leading vaccine program. So judge me not on these character assassinations, but judge me on the basis of what I got done. And just think back to when we were run by someone who did dot all of the I's and cross all the T's and took civil service advice all the time and did everything exactly to the letter, Theresa May. Her government was a disaster. So I, lots of voters, I think, are going to judge that whatever has happened here, and it's still purely speculative, they voted for Boris Johnson to get certain things done and he's been getting them done, and they don't really care how he pays for his wallpaper. OK, Martin, I can see you applauding there. You're also agreeing with that. Let's hear what you've got to say. Hi. Um, yeah, I, do we really care? Um, I think general public, they are well aware of Boris and his failures. 
I think Johnson's got to be careful because let's be honest, all politicians are kind of tarred with a similar brush. Um, and it kind of reeks of the expenses scandal. Dave. Three words come to mind. Honesty, integrity and transparency. Danny's already mentioned transparency. Um, it's very difficult, and I, I agree with Martin as well, because at the end of the day, um, you know, everybody needs to be accountable. Everybody needs to be transparent. We expect a certain amount of moral standing with politicians in one sense, but in another, we don't. It's, it's a strange situation because we know that there are backhanders going on. We know that there's all sorts of different aspects to politics, which as a, you know, as a, as a person, you know, a UK citizen, I'm, I'm fully aware. I'm not aware of all the backhanders that go on. I'm not aware of all the inside conversations. So However, Dave, what you're saying is you just expect politicians to behave badly. Expectation is different. I think, um, I don't expect politicians to be, behave badly, but I think the majority of the population, unfortunately, would probably assume that in some way or another, politicians are there not only to represent themselves but all, and the, you know, the, the population, but also go that ex do go a little bit too far. You know, so, no, yeah, it, it's a difficult one. So, Daisy, it's a bit depressing now, isn't it, listening to what Dave's saying? I mean, because also Labour and the Dems are trying to make headway with this against, against the government. But and not, not everybody, but a number of people there saying, well, come on, does it really matter? And you've got Dave saying, well, frankly, we don't expect that much from our politicians anyway. It is depressing because some of us came into politics because we wanted to make a difference. And actually, I think the biggest shame of this story is that the Prime Minister and his team have spent every single day this week trying to paper over this story um, and cover up the source of funding for uh, a flat refurb, whilst at the same time pushing through the fire safety bill in Parliament, which is leaving thousands, hundreds of thousands of innocent leaseholders but just without sticking, any just financial sticking with the subject a minute. whatsoever. Just, just sticking with this subject a minute, in terms of the headway that you're making, I mean, part of the reason Boris Johnson is talking about every day this week is because you won't let it go. I'm not saying whether you're right or wrong to do that. But, but nonetheless, you don't seem to be making that much headway. I mean, for the people out there, so Dave, uh, Martin, I saw Colette was uh, sh shaking her head as well, thinking that this subject doesn't really matter that much. How do you, can you convince people like that that actually this does matter? Well, the accusations have only just come out. This anomaly has only just appeared. And so there's clearly time for this story to run. It should matter because the Electoral Commission, which is a financial regulator of elections and of political parties, sees that the evidence, they say that the, the evidence, they think there are reasonable grounds to actually investigate this. And that is a very serious matter. And I think the public may be reserving judgment to see what comes out. But I think people should worry because Downing Street could have come clean at the start of this week, and they've refused to do so. We now know that the Prime Minister has appointed a so-called independent investigator, but the Prime Minister himself can veto the publication of that investigator's report. So he's hardly independent at all. And the point I was trying to make was that this is a real scandal. The real scandal of this story is that hundreds of thousands of leaseholders this week will be left without any financial protection for remediating fire safety defects and cladding on their flats, whilst the Prime Minister and his team are concerned about papering over a story about how he's refurbished his flat. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean Daisy's absolutely right. The, the country's in crisis. In my Leicester constituency, I've got businesses who are struggling, people who are losing their jobs. We've got thousands across the country sleeping on our streets. We've got child poverty increasing and children going hungry. And they don't have access to the Prime Minister in the way in which presumably wealthy donors have had access and have tried to buy influence because they're funding his decoration, his wallpaper, his bedding, his linen, his sofas, and goodness knows whatever else. And Tim, and, Tim says, and Tim says, with respect to him, you say, well, you know, the British public have voted for that, as if, you know, that's great. Well, well, maybe. Maybe they did. Maybe they did. And maybe it won't play out in the opinion polls. But I actually think it's important to fight for the values of integrity, honesty and transparency in politics. And that is why the Prime Minister should come clean and explain every bit of this, all the ins and outs, and he hasn't done that so far.
Tim. Both of, you, both, both of you have just described this as a distraction from the, from the country's very real problems. I agree. In which case, why are you banging on about it? Uh, you're it's you're levelling allegations. Integrity is important. You I'm sorry. You are levelling allegations which we haven't even got to yet because we still don't know the answer to the question of who originally paid for it. Now, if if there is a suggestion, if there is a suggestion uh, that there is an uncomfortable relationship between private capital and the government uh, that has gotten worse in the past year, I don't disagree with you. And it's a function of the lockdown. It's a function of our pandemic response and the amount of money that we have spent of which there has been no control because Britain has taken the attitude of we will spend whatever it takes in order to procure uh, medical equipment and vaccines. To give you one example, in the course of pursuing test and trace, the government has signed over 600 contracts, including no fewer than 2,300 consultants, one of which charged £6,624 per day. Britain has been leaking money for the last year. That's worth talking about. That's worth an inquiry. How much the Prime Minister personally paid for his wallpaper is a distraction. No, no, but the who reason paid why for it? About it who is made the, the donation is not a distraction. Money. Who made the donation is not a distraction. There's a reason why politicians have to declare donations, have to de declare loans, because people need to see that we're acting in the public interest, not in the particular interest of the donors and those who are funding our lifestyles. So it is not a distraction. It's about integrity and honesty in politics. And I still think that's worth fighting for. Fiona, I'm, yes. if I may, just, I mean, Tim's just done this, but, uh, and a lot of commentators this week have done this, which is pose this as an either or issue that, you know, you government should be getting on with, with facing up to the crisis that we're facing, or we should be, we're distracted. But actually we need both. We need urgent action on the issues that matter and we need transparency. You know, this country, we've had the Nolan principles for standards in public life for, what, 25 years, because it's a, it's a well-established principle that you can't have a high-functioning democracy without trust and without transparency. And so, for me, it's got to be both. Okay. And we've got that because the Electoral Commission is investigating that. I'm just asking us pretty please not to presuppose that we know the answers to what, what has gone on. And also don't assume bad faith. If the original plan was a blind trust, that doesn't necessarily equal buying access. And as I say, it is done in other countries. Right, I'm going to move on. We could talk about this for some considerable time. You've been sitting there very quietly, Anne Marie, I noticed. Well, I, Letting I everyone made, make the arguments for well, you. I That's I, excellent. I made, I okay. the point that, that we right. have many ways to <laughs> okay. uh, look at this and get the transparency well, we got no that lesson, everyone's talking about. We got and no indeed, lesson, that's what we shall have. We have and no we shall lesson, then all know the answer. We have no less than three inquiries. So let's hope we get an we'll answer out of one of them. Okay, I'm going to take another question from Natalie. Natalie Kilton. Given that the Fire Safety Bill has now passed through Parliament without any protection for leaseholders, what can be done right now to prevent the financial ruin of people who are facing unaffordable bills? Now, Natalie, I know because you've been on the programme before as part of our QT50 audience that you are in a particular predicament with it. So just explain to us what your situation is. So, unfortunately, I am trapped in a building at the moment that's got unsafe cladding. It's non-ACM cladding, but I'm not able to sell. I'm not able to move on from my home until that's remediated. And I potentially face the bill for tens of thousands of pounds to put right this issue unless, you know, I'm actually protected legally. And has anything the government has done so far in terms of uh, the, the bill that was passed today uh, or the, 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 uh, the, the, which is for £5 billion, pounds, but, but also for buildings above 18 metres, the developer has to pay for buildings lower than that. The leaseholders have to pay, but will have access to loans. What situation are you in? Is any of that helping you? So my building's above 18 metres, so the government have made available the non-ACM fund, but it's very, very limited in scope. It covers very specific types of clad. And, and the key thing is fire doesn't discriminate. And it's a lot more than just clad. And there's a lot of fire safety defects that these buildings have. And, it's actually come out that basically these buildings haven't been fit for purpose for such a long time and it's now all coming out and the government don't seem to be willing to step up and do the right thing and actually protect people's lives because ultimately this is a safety issue and if I went out tomorrow and bought a toaster I'd probably have more legal protection on that toaster than I have had on my biggest purchase that I've pumped my life savings into. And what is the value of that biggest purchase at the moment? Zero. This is the thing at the moment, I can't get a valuation on my home. 
and until the cladding's fixed and we've got an external wall survey which seems a long time off I'm going to be trapped here in a, a valueless home that I've put my life savings into. So Anne-Marie the government's managed to get a bill through today mm -hmm. but talk, talk to Natalie it's, it's not helping her. So first of all you know I think this has been such a a uh, big scandal and one that the government has wanted to uh, get to grips with, uh, you know, understand the extent of the challenges. Uh, and I think the fire safety bill uh, that has, has gone through today, as you say, Fiona, um, it is, is the starting point and it's that commitment. Robert but Denick, how can you help? How can you help Natalie there now? Because this has been going on for, for some considerable time, obviously since Grenfell, and Natalie's stuck. So absolutely. And I, you know, the, the five billion fund is that is that starting point to make sure uh, that we can start to get to grips with this. They would say it is a huge, you know, logistical exercise as, uh, you know, we know we, the extent of uh, the cladding that isn't uh, fit for purpose. But I, th I hear absolutely the point you make, which is, of course, it is more than that, the challenges with fire doors and all the access points and those sorts of issues. Uh, and this is, you know, this is a, a scandal that we are going to have to unravel. But I hope very much that the initial stages are going to be a starting point. But I think that is the challenge with a number of these things is, is a understanding the scale of the problem, which took us a while, I think, to get a full picture across the country uh, and to find the right tools to help move that forward. And I think this is a, a very difficult challenge. And I, you know, I do feel in, enormously for Natalie, but I hope very much that this will be a starting point for solutions. And so when Boris Johnson said we are determined that no leaseholder should have to pay for the unaffordable cost of fixing safety defects that they did not cause are no fault of their own, you've got Natalie there who's facing exactly that when it comes to perhaps not the cladding, but other things like fire breaks, combustible balconies, sprinklers, fire doors. I mean, when he said that, did he just not mean it? No, he did. And I think that's why I say the fire safety bill is, is uh, that first stage and the fund to help uh, get to grips with uh, the complexity and the enormity of, of this uh, scandal that we have to help uh, to unravel. Uh, but I, I don't for a moment deny that this is a big challenge to deal with and there is a huge amount of work to be done both in you know physical uh, change work and indeed working out where those challenges are um, and I hope you know very much that we'll be able to support Natalie and many others in the weeks and months to come. Well Dave this is obviously something you were very keen to bring up. The impact of this bill going through for people like Natalie and the hundreds of thousands of leaseholders is absolutely devastating. I was on the committee last summer I joined the committee that was scrutinizing this particular piece of legislation and I introduced the principle that leaseholders should not have to pay for fire safety defects that are not of their making. And Liberal Democrats have stood with leaseholders from the very start to the very end. And last night, we were the ones who pushed the amendment again. And we made it absolutely clear to the government that every single leaseholder affected by the cladding and the fire safety scandal would have preferred for that bill to have fallen last night than for it to pass into law. Because this bill has now passed into law and leaseholders who have already received enormous bills for 50, 60, 70,000 pounds are now possibly going to receive even more bills, possibly in a matter of days, and they cannot afford to pay it. So they are trapped. So they who, are do you trapped think, Daisy, who do you think should be paying that bill? Do you think the government can, in fact, put the onus on developers to pay it? It might bankrupt some of them, I don't know. Or do you think ultimately it'll be the government, therefore the taxpayer, who pays well, it? First of all, let me say that I introduced this principle 10 months ago. 10 months ago and for 10 months the government has refused to come up with a system to sort this out so it's on the government for not coming forward with a system i support what the cladding action group is calling for which is to say the government should stump up the money in the first instance to remediate and make these homes safe because they are fire traps they are death traps it is outrageous that almost four years on from the grenfell tragedy we think it's OK for people to live in these kind of places. So the government should stump up the cash, then it should very quickly put in a system to get as much of that money back as possible from the people who are responsible. But leaseholders need to know that they are protected because they can't afford to pay the bills. They're stuck in death trap flats. Some of them are facing bankruptcy. Some of them have become homeless. And if some of them who are not bankrupt yet but do become bankrupt may invalidate their legal professional qualifications and ruin their careers. This is a national scandal of epic proportions. The government has had 10 months to come up with a solution to this and they've refused to do so. Tim. I agree, this really is a scandal. Grenfell was in 2017. It was a man-made disaster. And as well as the people directly involved in it, it has also had a terrible human repercussions for thousands of others. People who found themselves not just living in apparently unsafe accommodation, 
uh, but also, as a result, financially stuck, unable to move out, unable to do anything, facing extraordinary costs. And what the government has thus far uh, offered has been in a mixture of grants and loans, and some of them proceeding very slowly, uh, simply isn't enough to meet that. Uh, the government has, I'm afraid I agree, in the first instance got to uh, cop up the cash. Um, it's, as the Dib Dem say quite rightly, it then needs to claw it back from the private contractors, who in most cases are the people actually responsible uh, for this particular scandal. We also need to know precisely what accommodation is safe, what isn't safe, we, we need to see that which is not safe improved immediately, because to stress once, just to finish by repeating, it's not just a financial problem, it's also that technically people are living in unsafe accommodation, mm. uh, and that shouldn't, that simply should not be allowed to happen. Mm. Colette? So, there's a couple of things here, I mean, I've, who's liable for this? I mean, poor Natalie, if she had a fire now, is she insured? Um, why did it took four years and what's it going to take to actually get something to do, somebody to do something about this and make sure these buildings are safe for people to live in? Um, you know, four years and we don't even know which ones are safe yet. And why should the leaseholders be left with this bill? It should predominantly be the contractors or actually the planning departments and safety departments that actually pass these off. Um, somebody somewhere has to take responsibility for this and it should not be the leaseholder. Joe? Um, you know, and where are the insurers in this? Joe? Um, hi, yeah, I'd like to go back to Anne-Marie. Um, Anne-Marie, you've alluded that this is um, the first step in a measure of steps that the government are going to take. Um, I'd like to know what those next steps might be and how that could maybe offer some reassurance to the people that are currently living in fear um, and are in financial hardship. Um, I think... Grenfell's nearly four years ago. I think the government's had four years to consider the position, to gather the data, to consult with industry experts, to perhaps come forward with some suggestions and a roadmap. Um, whilst I understand this does offer some relief, evidently it does not resolve the problem and it leaves many, many people in a very hopeless and desperate situation. So perhaps you could tell me what, what your thoughts are on the roadmap. So when is it going to be resolved for someone like Natalie then, Anne-Marie? When is Natalie going to be in a position where she's not going to have to be stumping up for these things that are, through no fault of her own, she's living in unsafe accommodation? So I think that's, that's the challenge um, uh, that government has. And I think, you know... But what's the answer? So as I'm, as I'm not Rob Jenrick, I can't give you the detail of uh, that continuing plan, but I think the reality but is... If you know this is just the start, you must have some idea what's coming next. Well, no, I think that what, what I see and, and, you know, the way... Uh, you know, any great challenge is tackled is that there's been this huge amount of analysis to work out how big the problem is, and it is indeed much larger uh, than perhaps was initially understood. Uh, and the challenge is with this first, with the bill to actually set this in place and the funds to help uh, move that forwards. But there is an ongoing challenge. There's obviously uh, the work that's been done now to make sure that, you know, uh, cladding is now safe, that we aren't going to be ever using the sort of uh, unsafe cladding that was there. And there's still but, a long way to go on that, as I'm sure but you But know. I, But I think, I think that's right. I think this is the real, really big challenge. It is a huge challenge. Uh, and, you know, dealing okay. with each so, part. So, but the, so the, the, the frustration is, is, is... In the nicest possible way, you don't know. I'm not saying to, that to be mean. No, no, no. I, 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 as I said to you... I can't answer your question, Joe. I can't answer the no. detail, okay. but I think without doubt, this is going to continue and we are going to have okay. to keep working on it to make sure that we get to a point uh, that everyone is able to be remediated as required. The Sunday time. Just, so let me, yeah. I just need to get around this panel. Sorry, I know you feel passionately about it. John. Uh, I mean, li listening to Natalie, I can... The fact that you've been so let down over this is just unforgivable. But and thank you for speaking so openly and actually bravely, because I know there'll be many leaseholders, like them in my own constituency, who uh, are, are feel the same but don't feel that they've got the confidence to come out on television and speak about their personal circumstances in, in that way. So thank you. Thank you for what you've done. I, I agree with Daisy. I agree with Tim. Having disagreed with Tim on the last question, I agree with him uh, on this one. Now, I've, I lead for the Labour Party on health, so I've not been involved in the particulars of the bill, but I will just speak more broadly and say, as it happens, I was on question time the week of Grenfell, uh, and the panel and the audience were united in grief and were united in, the, in our determination that something like that should never happen again. And I just find it utterly bewildering that here we are four years later and this still has not been resolved in a satisfactory way. And the bill that has gone through Parliament has clearly been a hugely missed opportunity. And it's simply not fair 
for leaseholders through no fault of their own to be okay. facing not only this great expense, but the ongoing fear of what might happen to them and their children and their families should something horrific go wrong. So this clearly needs fixing as soon as possible. Danny. But my heart goes out to Natalie and the hundreds of thousands of people who will be disappointed by this news today, probably angry. I, I want to just step back a little bit about the fear that Joe talked about, because up and down our country, there are people, hardworking people, who are living in fear about their financial security. You know, we have carers, we clapped our carers, yet the majority of carers in this country are living in poverty. We haven't addressed child poverty. We haven't talked enough about free school meals. The issue after issue, we're sleepwalking into a poverty crisis. One in five British people were in living in poverty before this pandemic. But this isn't necessarily a poverty crisis. This is people who, I'm not speaking for everybody, people who've, who've been able to afford to, to, to buy their own homes and they, they found themselves in a position where, I mean, they may be forced into penury because of this, but they aren't, they aren't in it because of the poverty crisis. No, but we already know that in 2020, 700,000 more people fell into poverty as a result of the pandemic. And I, the problem is if you take each of these issues and lay it upon each other, the insecurity that people feel that will drive more people into, into poverty. OK, let's take another question now from Tim Dow. Tim. Uh, hi. Um, with COVID cases and deaths in India continuing to increase, is the British government doing enough to support India? Uh, Daisy. No, I don't, think the, I don't think the UK government is doing enough to support India. Now, I know that the UK government has already sent some medical supplies, but what we absolutely vitally need the government to do is to send vaccines. So back in February, the Liberal Democrats wrote to the government and said after the first four million most vulnerable people in the UK have been vaccinated, we think that the government should embark on a, uh, a parallel rollout of the vaccine through the UK and through COVAX, which is the international vaccine scheme. And so when you, Daisy, sorry, when you say the first four million, do you mean to the age of 50? No, you mean uh, sooner than that. Uh, it, was the first four, it was the first four million, which I think was the first four or five cohorts. But we're way beyond that now. The situation we have is that none of us are safe until all of us are safe. And for as long as people in India cannot get the vaccine, not only will loads of people die, but it also means that the virus will mutate again. And that will turn up into other strains that will wash up on our shores. So it is both the morally right thing to do and also a self-interested thing to do to make sure that we get this parallel rollout. Now, Norway is doing it. The US is sending vaccines too. At the moment, the UK government has not yet committed to sending vaccines to India. But and hang on, because the, the US is sending do. vaccines it's not using. Well, we need to say we need lots of countries to be sending vaccines to India. And what we think, the Liberal Democrats think, is that the government should be enrolling on this parallel rollout of the vaccine. Because we know that with all the vaccines that have been ordered, we actually have a surplus in the UK. And so we could actually embark on this parallel rollout where we're vaccinating our own population whilst also sending some vaccines through the COVAX international scheme as well. As I say, it's morally the right thing to do and it's self-interested because for as long as we don't vaccinate people, they will die and the virus will mutate and it will wash up on our shores. Now, Danny, I'm, obviously I'm interested in your perspective as, as head of Oxfam uh, GB. You can see that for some, there, there would be some who will not take Daisy's view, who would think, well, actually, I want to get myself vaccinated first before I start sending vaccines abroad. Look, first, we just need to recognise how devastating what's going on in mm. India really is. This is not a wave, this is a tsunami. And many, many experts said it was a question of when, not if, we'd see these sorts of impacts. And we've seen it in Brazil, we've seen it in South Africa, now we're seeing it in India. And I think there is a debate about what more we could do about excess stock, but we believe that the real answer lies in, in not fighting about the pieces of the vaccine pie, but making the pie bigger. Mm -hmm. And what we're calling on the UK government to do is to ease the intellectual property rules around who owns these vaccine technology, who owns these vaccine recipes. You know, we... But rather than do what Daisy's suggesting, which is after the first four million have been vaccinated, start sending vaccines abroad. I do both. But right. the really substantial difference is going to be made when we allow other manufacturers, other countries to safely manufacture these vaccines. The US government has said it's considering this seriously, but in, in the World Trade Organization negotiations so far, our government has blocked those sorts of moves. Mm. And yet we're talking about... For example, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine is 97% funded by us, the public, the taxpayers. And yet 
We're and also putting, is, is, is being sold at cost. It's, uh, yes, but we're putting the interests of a few big pharmaceuticals above the interests of, of, of people around the world. And we're, you know, the more this vaccine you know, rips through countries like India, the more chances it will mutate and the less effective the amazing, remarkable progress we've made here in this country with vaccination will be. And so, as, as Daisy says, no one is safe until everyone is safe. And the best way to do that is to loosen the rules on, on who owns the right to produce those vaccines. And can you see the government doing that, Emily? So, interestingly, um, when I was Secretary of State for DIPID last year, um, I was the one who worked Department with Garvey... Department for International Development. Uh, as it was, yes, sorry. Um, now merged with, uh, into the Foreign Commonwealth Development Office. Um, I worked with Garvey, uh, which is uh, the Vaccine Alliance. Uh, we raised $8.8 .8 billion uh, for them last year, uh, which was uh, over a billion more than was uh, our target, so that they would then also be able to help uh, get going on a vaccine programme to help uh, developing countries if and when a vaccine, which at the time seemed like a very long way off, uh, something that was possible. Uh, we then worked with the WHO to set up COVAX so that we could find a way to harness exactly, as everyone is saying, the, the, the ability for Gavi to be able to deliver into those countries vaccines as and if, because it still felt like it at the time, um, there was a vaccine coming. And so in we, terms of what Danny's saying, you're sitting right next to you there, in terms <laughs> of loosening uh, property rights, what would you say to him about that? So, uh, that's working across the world. So interestingly, with uh, Oxford AstraZeneca, uh, they made a commitment up front that uh, 300 million doses would uh, feed COVAX. And we have, we have now invested 548 million into COVAX and it's been match funded by other donors. So it's now got a billion uh, pounds to work with. And to be uh, part of its purpose is to be able to buy vaccines at cost and ensure that there can be that shared production, both for developed countries who are buying it, but also that COVAX can be buying for developing countries. But the uh, UK is opposing waiving intellectual property rights. Danny's suggesting that maybe you could change your mind about that. Is there any chance of you doing that? So these discussions are ongoing, as Danny says, with the WTO, and I'm not, I'm not party uh, to the detail. But the important thing is developing and getting those vaccines made. So really interestingly, last year... Uh, well, I'm only putting it because that's the question he's asked you, so I'm just well, trying I, to I, get I'm an answer here. to it. I, I appreciate I all the other things are being done, but at the moment, well, okay, so that's I not something I you know I can't answer because I'm not in the WTO conversation. Okay, but you're here representing but, the government but, tonight. But really, important, What's your view? really importantly, one of the challenges, and we knew this would be a challenge, is the ability to pr produce the vaccine in the quantities that are needed because, you know, India's population over a billion and so on. There is, there is a need for the quantum. Interestingly, um, Bill Gates made a really... Uh, what was then a very punchy move last summer and said, I'm going to create vaccine production facilities. Don't know if there'll be a vaccine invented that we can use, but so that there could be that increase. India, of course, has been the heart of vaccine production for other vaccines mm. uh, for okay. very, very many countries for many years. Lots of big sighs coming from Danny there. Well, I just, you know, last week, a hundred odd world leaders wrote to several governments to say that the single biggest difference can be made by allowing these manufacturers Many vaccine or pharmaceutical factories are sitting and not producing COVID vaccines because they don't have access to these rights. It's the single biggest thing to do to be, create a people's vaccine and sol you know, make the biggest difference in terms of protecting all of us immediately. And I think, okay. you know, the production continues to grow okay. and this issue, but I think really okay, importantly, no, no, just... we need to make sure that we have, and we are seeing, and it's so tragic uh, in India, the breakdown of a health service be, by being overwhelmed by COVID right. is something that we have to help them to get back from so that indeed their health services can deliver vaccines for their people. Beatrice. If we're talking about sending um, vaccines abroad, then why do people keep on mentioning in the UK vaccinate, vaccinating 12 year olds now when surely it would be more helpful to send vaccines over to the most vulnerable in other countries and then it would benefit everybody? Well, we're not, we're not vaccinating 12-year-olds now. The, the tests are being done, see if, if that could be done in the future. We're not actually doing that now. Chris? What I'd like to know is if we've developed the AstraZeneca vaccine as basically a people's vaccine, why are the Indian facilities not using the directions for making that so that they can um, overcome the shortfall of vaccines? Um, that, well, they, Chris, they are. Not... They're making 70 million a month, but obviously it's a huge population in India and they're just, you know, they're struggling to, to get enough vaccine yeah. out. In addition, um, do we actually need to, to um, talk about um, giving away intellectual property rights when we could just simply be saying, come on, guys, you've made a fortune out of producing vaccines and selling them. Um, 
why don't you sell these vaccines to India at cost or use some of your profits to underwrite the cost of sending vaccines to India? Of course, AstraZeneca, AstraZeneca is, is, I'm only saying because they're not here to answer for themselves, AstraZeneca is, is producing the vaccines, is selling the vaccines at cost. That but, was part of the agreement which with it was receiving part, but, government But obviously funding. the others are, are, are not doing that. John? Well, what we're seeing in India is, is desperate, it's heartbreaking. The, the stories of oxygen being purchased on the black market mm -hmm. because hospitals are, are overwhelmed is awful. We're hearing stories, we're seeing pictures of cremations taking place in streets and car parks. And for a country like ours, with our deep ties of India, and I represent Leicester, I live in Leicester, where we're immensely proud of our deep bonds with India. Yes, we do need to do more. I'm pleased that the government have done something, uh, and we were calling for them. Lisa Nandy and I were calling for the government to, to take action, but we do need to do a lot more. Well, let's talk about the more. action that you've been calling for, because in the letter you wrote uh, on Monday, I think it was, yeah. and you talked about uh, when... We when we have a surplus of vaccines, we should be giving vaccines to countries like India. At what point do you think we do get to well, a surplus of I, vaccines? Are we at that point now? I think, I think we have to play our part in vaccines, in drugs, but I think what but is... So what does that mean when it comes well, to well, vaccines? Do you well, think we should be sending vaccines to India now? Is well, that what you mean issue, by that letter? Part of the issue in India is, yes, they need access to vaccines, but also they need investment in their primary care networks to get the vaccines distributed. But what we also need... But so is your international... position from the vaccines... Sorry? I'm no, just no, trying no. to be... Because you wrote this in your letter on Monday. You said so when we get... A surplus of vaccines should be sent to India. Is your position any different from the government's, which is saying we should vaccinate our population no, and our, our then position, our position, start sending our vaccines position is, Our position is different. And because, so what is it exactly? Because what we now desperately need is an international agreement about shared intellectual property rights on vaccination. What we need is investment in vaccination manufacturing capacity So you think the, the property the rights should be loosened? I, I think that has to be looked at. We need an international agreement on that urgently. We need an international agreement on investing in the manufacturing and uh, capability in parts of the world so they can start doing their own vaccine manufacturing. As it happens, India can manufacture, but there's many parts of the world that can't. We need an international agreement around genomic sequencing <clears throat> as well. But for and what we should be doing now, John, because no, 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 the crisis is, is now, is should we be sending vaccines to India now, of do you think? Of course we should, but... That, so but we, it, should but be. It, we should we be. We should, but, but Fiona, it's not as simple as just saying send them vaccines. No, no, because what we're, the what, we are now, what we're facing with India is not just an issue of... I mean, they've got the Serum Institute, we can actually produce 70 million vaccines uh, a month. Part of the issue with India is investment in their primary care network to distribute the vaccines. It's about investment in their, in, their, in their health infrastructure to get oxygen out to people. But what this crisis shows us is that, as Daisy says, uh, we are not safe until everywhere is safe. And that is not a political slogan. That is a scientific fact. Because while the virus continues to circulate across the world, it will mutate and it will bounce back and hit us and could set us back. We've already got examples of the Indian variant here in the UK. We've got it in Leicester. Okay. We've got it in parts of, parts of London. Right. It's why we have to Let act now. PS, you had your hand up. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a little sad that we have to use an argument of self-interest in order to rationalise and justify sending things to India when they're in such a dire state. I really don't think that argument is particularly... Uh, helpful. I think, you know, there is a huge moral uh, imperative to help India. It's going through incredible pain. Um, you know, sending 600 ventilators or pieces of hospital equipment is a drop in the ocean. I mean, the British Association of Physicians of Indian Origin issued a statement saying that we can do so much more. We have empty Nightingale hospitals. We have huge ties, as Jonathan said, to India. And, um, you know, I just think it's a real shame that the argument keeps... We try, we try to convince ourselves as a nation that we have to do this to protect ourselves. We actually have to do this to protect thousands upon thousands of people dying every day in India. Tim? I, I agree with much of that. Uh, I thought John had some very good points, but subtly dodged the tricky question of what is the point at which you judge the country now has a surplus. So is it, for instance, once we have vaccinated everyone over the age of 42, is it the case that anything that we're doing after that counts ethically as a surplus? And that's a very difficult question to answer. I think globally, there's eventually going to have to be some sort of redistribution of vaccines, whether it's the vaccines themselves or the intellectual property rights. But it might also be the case that uh, here in Britain, we, we hit a point at which we judge that 
we have protected the most vulnerable in our society, people of a certain age or people with certain health conditions. Now, that's the point at which we should start to redistribute our own vaccines or put other countries first. And that poses an interesting question to my generation, because uh, I'm proud to say I'm far too young to have received a vaccine yet, <laughs> far too young. You're just boasting now, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> so am I willing to delay getting the vaccine just as the country is opening up? Am I willing to delay my own liberation from lockdown in order to help people overseas? I have to say, personally, I very much am. I, I'm not just being virtue signaling here. I'm also saying that because I, I think that those of us who are relatively young and healthy have got to be willing to balance risk and to take risks to put the vulnerable first, but accept that we ourselves should live with a certain amount of danger because you could catch COVID, you could be run down by a car. When you're my sort of age, you're probably in the same realm of possibilities. So for my generation, who talk a good game on altruism, here's an opportunity for us to be truly altruistic and say, look, Britain has a moral responsibility to protect its own who are vulnerable. But beyond that point, the moral locus shifts to protecting people who are vulnerable overseas. Mm -hmm. And I agree very strongly with that point that this isn't this shouldn't be a debate about what is best for Britain. It is simply what is the right thing to do. And I think that would be the right thing to do. Okay. Can I just come in on? Yes, of course. I think uh, Tim's exactly right, because one of the amazing things that we've seen at Oxfam and, and many of the other charities that are working internationally is the amazing generosity of the British people and who are coming into our appeal for India. But at the same time, you know, the original question was, what more could the government be doing? Our government is cutting aid. Yesterday we found out that the, amongst the cuts will be an 80% reduction in funding for clean water and hygiene around the world. Yeah. It beggars belief that at a time of a global pandemic, when there are more people in need of humanitarian assistance than since the Second World War, our government is cutting funding for clean water and hygiene. I just can't understand that. So I think uh, to, to Danny's point, and I think it's, it's a really important one. And you know, we are still the third largest uh, overseas development aid uh, donor in the G7. Uh, and the Chancellor has set out very clearly that once our finances uh, in a better place, he wishes to take us back up to 0.7. That's a decision that's been taken. But really, and are you happy that the budget has been cut? So I think none of us are are happy. We want to do it, but the reality is we have to balance. But is it our a decision books. you agree with? Is what I'm asking. So the decision was taken uh, and the Foreign Secretary has set out his uh, priorities and how uh, that will Do you agree with forwards. that? Um, I think it's very, very, very difficult uh, to see any cuts in, in those bilateral programmes, uh, but choices have to be made. And, you know, I'm getting the sense that you didn't agree with it. And it's, quite fallen on, and it's fallen on the Foreign Secretary to make his choices. And he set out very clearly the other day um, where his priorities were and how his role, and one of them uh, was indeed COVID. But I think really importantly with COVAX, uh, which we helped to set up last year, we have the opportunity to do that. And I think the really important point on the vaccines is that they we don't have a surplus yet. We're working on a, you know, one in, one out at the moment still. And that's what's really important. Tim's Tim's challenge is a really interesting one. And I will, uh, you know, take that back and, and set it actually, which is, is it, should we be asking those who are, you know, the, those the vulnerable who are young have already been vaccinated, so if you had healthcare issues. But for the healthy young, is mm. that a... Is that a question we should be asking? The Prime Minister uh, made a very clear choice that he wanted to vaccinate uh, our adult population in order to protect us all. And that was a very, I think all of us, you know, felt that was a very good decision. And we have, you know, in fact, you know, demonstrated one yeah. of the most impressive vaccine rollouts. Incredible effort, not only with our NHS, but so many volunteers. Sure, sure, but the point you're making, I just... just but the, yes. the, the key point is, I think it's a really interesting challenge. Is that the case? that we want to uh, say, and our, our young people say, we would rather, as vaccines come off the factory line, because they're not here yet, but when they do, that we should send them first through COVAX and get Gavi to, to deliver those into developing countries. And I think that's a really interesting challenge. I mean, that, I was a challenge. That, that was the challenge. That was the challenge. That was precisely the challenge that Liberal Democrats put to the government in February of this year. We asked you to start thinking about it, precisely oh. that process of when and how we could have that parallel rollout of the but vaccine. But the key point is we but don't have again, the vaccine here we are, quantities Here we are, anyway. almost in May, but, but that's the government the hasn't even started but thinking it's, about it's, the challenge already. But, that's the problem. It's taken months and months and months and it but still we don't, hasn't we worked But we don't have the vaccines to be able to do something with it. It's, it's, still, not, it's not know, just... I mean, this is, I mean it's becoming a, de a, de a debate about, you know, X number of vaccines in this country and how many we send over there. Hmm. It's all about, also about what we are doing to invest in primary health care in some of the poorest parts of the world. And at the moment, of the 900 million vaccines that have been distributed worldwide, only 1% of them are in low-income countries. 
Some of that is about access to the vaccine, but a lot of that is also about their health infrastructure. Absolutely. And, and, that's and, and why... yet you're cutting the aid budget. But that's exactly what Gar that's exactly what Garvey's key role is to but help. You're cutting the aid budget. But we, well, we put we put. Uh, um, and you know, the polio we, eradication programme we as well. We raised 8.8 .8 billion last year to help Garvey to do that because exactly that, you're, you're not wrong, John. In those developing countries where the, the primary care systems are not very robust, that is where Garvey has this incredibly effective way of helping to get out. But, but what, they need, but what they need, But what they need is the vaccine, and that is one of the challenges we have as a planet, is that there simply wasn't the production capability that existed this time last year to be able to generate okay. billions of doses okay. of pace. And that's growing, but we need to, you know, keep at it. We have got time to get one more question in, which uh, I know the person who, who's asked it thinks is, is very important. I want to, and a number of people have expressed interest in this. Christina, Christina Sharp, let's hear from you. Chris. Thank you. Can there be any justification for the continued incarceration of people in care homes? Now, Chris, you've got a particular reason for asking this. Yes. Um, my late father's partner, who is a lady in her late 80s, is now in a care home. Um, she has Alzheimer's. Um, her daughter is allowed to visit her once a week for half an hour indoors and no more. Um, she's not allowed to go outside with her. Um, she's not allowed to see her at any other times. And the care home says, oh, well, it's just too difficult to do. But I can't see why it should be so difficult to allow a, a daughter to come in. This is, you know, with testing, um, with full PPE, um, at no risk to the residents who have all been vaccinated. Um, if this person was in prison, she'd probably have more rights to have visitors than she does now. OK. Danny. Look, I, I, can, I feel for you. Uh, my uncle is in ICU at the moment, and the only time we can see him is when he connects or the nurse takes a, a FaceTime uh, Zoom call that we have with him. And this is awful, but I think I, I generally trust our carers, our health system to try to judge that, you know, the, the clinical needs and the risks with the, the patient care and the family interests. Uh, I know it's difficult, but I think we have to trust that they're making the best the decisions in the best interests of, of people in their care. Tim? I think we have to listen to people who are in care and ask them precisely what it is they want. Uh, care is a balance. There is a balance to be struck between protecting people against the danger of the virus, but also uh, between avoiding making people's lives so miserable, trapping them indoors all day, denying them contact with people, that their life almost becomes not worth living. And it's a terrible thing to say, but that's how some people have expressed it. Uh, my question is, what are the rewards of being vaccinated right now? Once you have been vaccinated and you're in contact with other people who've been vaccinated, there surely should be the maximum liberty between those people. And if the people in care homes have been vaccinated, the people visiting them have been vaccinated. And if we know that vaccination reduces transmission as well as your chances of dying from the thing, I don't see why there can't be much greater contact between people. We've got to get this right because at the very beginning of this crisis, it was people in care homes who were failed the most because the virus was allowed into the care homes. It now feels in some cases as if the people in the care homes have been forgotten and are being left to languish there. Daisy. This is absolutely heartbreaking and uh, just before Christmas there was lots of evidence coming out about how the lockdown on care homes under the first wave, obviously um, carers have been going in and out and there have been waves of Covid, but a number of people actually died some pretty traumatic and distressing deaths because of the neglect, because there wasn't enough support. I think a lot, what a lot of people don't realise is that family carers are carers, they're not just visitors, they are carers and they do a huge amount of the care in the care home. So what, what happened think, now? Well, before Christmas, I coordinated a group of 40 MPs on a cross-party basis to actually ask the government to change two or three things. First of all, and this is what carers themselves were asking for, was that why was it OK for paid carers to be going in and out of care homes, but not for family carers to be going in and out? So we asked for family carers to be designated, uh, for family members to be designated as the, um, as the specific uh, carer, and for them to get access to the same level of testing that the paid carers were getting. Um, and I think what's really important in cases where you've mentioned people who have dementia, for example, their decline has been so rapid without that family contact that this is about the balance of harms. And so we do need to see measures in place to allow carers to see people. Otherwise, they are going to die of neglect 
rather than dying of COVID. And it is unbearable for those people and for their carers. So we need to see that acceleration. Okay. And care homes themselves are asking for protection, just like the hospitals have, like the NHS has, so that if um, there is... Uh, so they've got the insurance to protection up to allow it to We're going to run out of time. I'm sure. so sorry. Anne-Marie, looking into this, do you feel that the government's got the balance right? I mean, for example, if someone comes back, if a British citizen comes back from India, say... They have to self-isolate for 10 days. But if someone from a care home who's been vaccinated twice goes out for a walk, they have to then isolate for 14 days in their care home. Do you think the government's getting the balance right? So I think it's been an incredibly difficult year. And, you know, I feel for all those who've had family and um, many, many constituents of mine for whom this has been a, a really difficult challenge. Uh, you know, we had to... Once but do you think you're getting the balance right now? So I think it's, it's moving in the right direction. And uh, we've heard this week from uh, John Van Tam that there's a lot of clinical evidence coming through now. But that it's there is the, there is the level for of... It's incredibly And, and I think of... as we move forwards on the... On is now, you know, we're, we're nearly at May the 17th. That next, that next step, we start to be able to see uh, you know, the, the, the greater unlocking of our ability to uh, get out and about and meet people. And, you know... But do you, think, but do you think it's, it's, it's right now where you hear what Chris has got to say? And obviously many people have talked about the, the plight well, of Well, I think we, have to, I think we have to trust the health professionals. Different care homes uh, are, you know, slightly more or less, uh, you know, willing to change the rules. The rules are not the same in every care home. They run uh, to their own frameworks. But I think we yeah, are... Well, the, the guidance right is the same for every care home, of course, from, mm. from the government. John? Well, I mean... The way in which this pandemic has impacted upon those in receipt of adult social care is possibly one of the cruelest, most brutal, savage consequences of, of, of the crisis. And for somebody to be in social care, of course they need to be protected and not exposed to virus. And of course, staff have to have proper PPE and of course, loved ones have to, go, have to be tested and so on. But to not allow a resident to see their loved ones more than once a week or whatever the particular procedure is in that care home, I just think is absolutely scandalous. And it doesn't have to be like that now when, we ha when we've got PPE in place, infection control procedures in place, when there is vaccination being rolled out, mm -hmm. when there is testing. We're not talking about uh, allowing people who are with the virus to go in there untested and unvaccinated. There are very strict guidelines in place now so surely we can get a better system so in place would you because come it is so would you, cruel what is happening. Would you come out of lockstep with the government then in terms of, because May the 17th is obviously the next uh, easing restrictions, would you make it easier for, uh, for residents what, to get but, homes but, now? But what, what we're saying at the moment is that this is the, the particular care home we talked about is allowing just this one visit. I mean, you know, it doesn't have to be like that. This isn't a sort of, this isn't a kind of clinical decision. This is a, a decision about the guidelines and these guidelines clearly need to be looked at and reviewed. Chris, very briefly, a last word from you. I think my, my friend would rather be in prison. She actually believes that she has been put in prison. Um, and I think it is terrible to think that in her late years, when she's probably not going to live for much longer, she doesn't have the comfort of her family around her, of just half an hour once a week with one person who has been tested and is putting her at no risk whatsoever. Oh, Chris, well, listen, thank you for telling us about her story this evening. We really appreciate it. Our hour is up, I have to say. Uh, that, is that, that is it from us here this evening. Uh, next week, we will be joined by the former Speaker of the House of Commons, John Burko. Remember him? Uh, and comedian and self-styled guilty feminist, Deborah Francis White. So you don't want to miss that. Do join us. For tonight, though, thank you very much to the panel for joining us. Tim, very good to see you down the line. Hopefully we'll see you in the studio before too long. And, of course, to our audience, our QT50, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and to you at home, of course. Thank you very much for watching. Good night.